Many thanks, Katie, for the very warm welcome. And as much as I would like to be now with you in the cathedral and uh, in the shadowy uh, realms of a nice medieval architecture, in a way, it's quite appropriate that we talk about uh, the main, uh, meeting manuscripts on Zoom uh, and bringing together the audience from different places. Because if you look at the illustration, which I've chosen as a title illustration, you see in a way a 15th century imagining of a Zoom meeting. Because it's a scene that never took place uh, in person. The nuns uh, lived in a strict enclosure within the convent. And so uh, you see on the left hand side, three nuns with a pointed veils and a red cross um, reminding them of their marriage to Christ. Behind them, you see a lay sister who in real life would be in a different part of the convent, working in the kitchen or uh, helping with a, 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 a handiworks of the convent, such as tapestries. And they are all kneeling on a, a lawn which isn't so much the lawn of the convent as the imagined garden of Christ, the Hortus Conclusus of the Song of Songs in which you could meet. And uh, they are joined um, on the right hand side by a group of lay people who in real life wouldn't be allowed to enter uh, the enclosure. So they would only be um, below the nuns in the church at the West End on, on high feasts, but uh, certainly not enjoying the meadows uh, together. And they are united in their adoration of the setting sun, which is the Easter sun, um, which symbolizes Christ who has risen uh, on Easter morning, like the, the sun with the Psalm verse, the, uh, going like a bridegroom out of the wedding chamber and is now setting and the nuns are saying in Latin, um, vale o dies sine vespera, goodbye o day uh, that should never end. And the lay people um, join in, uh, as it were on mute, <laughs> with, uh, saying, O söte dach, wolltest du bi uns blieben? So that's the, uh, local dialect, low German, Plattdeutsch in modern German, or sweet day, if only you would stay with us. So it's an imagined community of um, people uh, eager on the same intent uh, in an exchange about uh, what it means to celebrate Easter. And I want to look at the manuscript really as a way of communication, as an outreach project to um, bring the contents that the nuns were passionate about to a wider audience. So, um, in so far, we are in a good company meeting on screen or like the nuns on one page. Uh, it's singing from the same hymn sheet or uh, speaking from the same Zoom screen. Before I take you through the journeys that these particular manuscripts have undertaken, so um, the manuscript you see on screen is now in the Bodleian Library in Oxford, um, so just about half a kilometer from where I'm speaking uh, now, but it was written in Northern Germany and it moved to uh, Oxford in a quite complicated move across different stations. And I will be following that and how it changes um, the use of the manuscript. But before I uh, look at that, I'll look at a kind of counter movement from England to Germany. Uh, so I, I thought I would start uh, with a manuscript which is the way in which um, St. Albans is best known in uh, Germany. So I'd heard of the Albani Psalter is as a teenager and as luck would have it, I just found again um, a Brillenputztuch. Um, 
which I, I was given as a, a student, and that has um, a, a friend of mine bought it in the cathedral shop in Hildesheim. And it's a miniature from the Albani uh, St. Albans Psalter, um, which ended up in Hildesheim. And um, on the journey from St. Albans to Hildesheim, via Lamspringe, the convent that was given to the English Benedictine when they went uh, into exile, um, they actually crossed paths. So several of the Meding manuscripts were also given to Lamspringe. So they rubbed shoulders on the uh, shelves of the convent there, and they are now um, uh, uh, side by side in the cathedral library in Hildesheim. So um, I, I won't go through the St. Albans Psalter in that much detail, but at the point in time when the paths cross, I'll have some comparative images of meeting manuscripts and the St. Albans Psalter. And it struck me just uh, this morning that actually you could follow the stages of the St. Albans Psalter from its first production via its reworkings, um, first for uh, Christina uh, and then uh, in the Reformation period when, for example, the word Pope was crossed out uh, in the manuscript, then across the channel uh, to and could compare that really with a, a meeting uh, manuscripts. And I'll, I'll look at the two stages of producing uh, the prayer books through different reworkings and then how they spread across Europe and indeed actually even to uh, the state, some of the manuscripts over um, the centuries. And um, to reflect on the fascination of medieval manuscripts and how they have been messengers for different um, communities across the periods. So that will be my final conclusion before we then enter the discussion about medieval manuscripts as messengers. Um, to give you a, a kind of eagle eyes view of the geographic area we are dealing with, um, the uh, red highlighted um, square is the area where the convents um, of sponsored by the salt from the Lüneburg salt mines are located and it is a you could call it kind of monastic landscape with a very characteristic um, profile and uh, the most remarkable thing about these convents is that they never ceased to exist so they were uh, founded in the 12th, 13th century um, and they underwent several reforms but um, the women negotiated successfully the Lutheran Reformation and managed as the only uh, institutions within the Protestant uh, German lands to uh, continue to work as communities and if you go now into this region, you'll find a beautiful medieval architecture, but uh, a very alive and kicking community of women living there as Protestant Cistercians and Protestant Benedictines, um, never uh, completely dissolved. And um, Katie mentioned my one project editing the meeting prayer books my other current project is editing the letters 1800 letters written between these convents during the reformation period where they uh, formed a very strong lobby network to um, negotiate their continued existence so it, it's a um, marvelous example of a strong medieval woman uh, in a good parallel to uh, what you have with Christina of Marchett in uh, St. Albans. 
And I also wanted to have uh, this um, a map of uh, the Hanseatic League uh, around 1500, so the period when most of the Meding manuscripts were produced, um, to remind us that um, the channel for most parts of its history was a rather a way of um, facilitating a journey than to um, uh, work as a barrier. So um, we just had uh, the final event in a project that looked at digitizing manuscripts from Oxford and from Northern Germany. And uh, one of the speakers for that event, uh, Professor Joanna Story, talked about Anglo-Saxon manuscripts and the perhaps surprising um, fact that the majority of Anglo-Saxon manuscripts isn't um, in England or even in, in Britain or Ireland, but it's in Germany. So uh, more than half of uh, the surviving Anglo-Saxon manuscripts traveled um, across uh, with the missionaries or were produced in the insular style in, in Germany. So that is a manuscript crossing going back um, well into the um, 8th, 9th, 10th century. And then you had a very strong network at the period when the St. Albans Psalter was produced between um, the houses of the Guelphs in northern uh, Germany, so uh, the region where um, uh, Brunswick, Braunschweig, Lüneburg, uh, Duke, Henry the Lion, uh, who married an English princess. And um, his uh, daughter-in-law founded uh, the convent Wienhausen, that's the furthest down blue dot you see on the uh, map here, Wienhausen. And um, as it happens, my background, which is kind of semi-virtual, so it's uh, not an original, but uh, also not a virtual background. It's 92 sheets of A3 paper uh, glued together with two rolls of parcel tape, tape uh, to make a facsimile of a tapestry that the nuns of Wienhausen produced in uh, the uh, late 12th century. Um, and that has, you can see behind me, the coat of arms of uh, the families across um, uh, Europe and um, representing the story of Tristan and Isolde, also a European story about traveling between Ireland, Brittany, uh, England, and equally popular in Northern Germany among the nuns as it was um, in the Bretagne and in, um, in England. So, this map just to show that there uh, has had been a centuries long um, back and forth of manuscripts before even the meeting nuns started producing their uh, manuscripts. And, uh, so the current spread of manuscripts across Europe so you see the green dots are where meeting manuscripts are now uh, located and a, quite a number are in, in, in England um, mirrors this uh, historic connection. And um, you see also here this red, the furthest down south red dot is Lampspringe and that's uh, the convent near Hildesheim, where the St. Albans Psalter um, was for several centuries and met with the meeting manuscripts uh, that were coming from north, while the St. Albans Psalter came uh, from the west. Um, this is a blow up of the uh, start of the uh, heat map, how where most of the manuscripts are located. But uh, just to start, um, 
with a, a prayer book from meeting that gives us a bit of insight into why and when these manuscripts were produced. And I've taken this from uh, this little booklet, which uh, you can download and make for yourself. This is a booklet that the nuns produced as a, a tool for the lay sisters so that they le could learn to write proper Gothic. So the lay sister had entered the convent after um, re uh, learning to read and write the vernacular language in a parish school, uh, but uh, they had um, just mastered a kind of business hand for writing letters um, for trade. And they hadn't uh, mastered uh, the kind of formal hand that was thought appropriate for religious manuscripts. Uh, so the nuns were giving them model alphabet and also a model for the different styles of initials. So you see a big A for uh, um, the start of major, like a word template where you have a style sheet for heading one and then the red initial for the father unser de du bist in dem himmel so our father the first prayer um yeah, just two lines big um a lombarde and then you have uh, the the second a after the big initial a is a cardellen initiale one uh, so style sheet for heading three and then you have an example for every uh, letter of the alphabet so that you can put together your own text. And um, on a flyleaf uh, in one of uh, the other meeting manuscripts, uh, there is a little programmatic poem which I'm going to read to you in the language that was used among the nuns, a kind of um, the equivalent nowadays would be a Denglish, a mix of uh, German and English. So it's um, uh, Latin, German, macaronic text that plays with the different resonances of the languages. So uh, Latin is used for the formal um, didactic means and German is used for the emphatic emotional bits. So salutis ad preludium sit artis nobis studium wohl an die Schrift forstan. Quosine stat in ozio clausales hoi devotio. Nicht lesen is oeveldan. Not to read uh, means doing evil. So, um, as I said, uh, German is used for this emphatic uh, uh, emphasis on uh, the importance of, of reading um, and the uh, German uh, and Latin is used for the established language of religion like devotio, studium, uh, these kind of key terms. And uh, this emphasis on studying is uh, brought to the fore in 1497 when uh, the reform movement that swept northern Europe, the Devotio Moderna, uh, reached uh, the convents in um, Lüneburg. And you see, uh, this is a reproduction of the 18th century of a medieval panel painting that the nuns hung up um, around 1500 to commemorate their reform of 1479. And it shows the key elements of reform. And uh, you see um, the importance of reading. So the provost is uh, there larger than life uh, with five books um, under his arm, big folio format. So these were the liturgical books that were uh, written for the reformed convent. You see um, a small nun, one of the novices, behind a lectern. Um, always the youngest nun had to do uh, the table reading, but she was allowed to eat before the other so that she wouldn't 
uh, eat with a rumbling stomach, as uh, the rule said. So you see uh, her reading out um, the uh, book, and you see on the left hand side uh, the Mater Celeraria, the um, nun who was uh, responsible for the cellar or the overseeing of the kitchen. And she is just tasting with a spoon uh, the big um, stew uh, that the conversa, the lay sister, is brewing because uh, the new thing was that everybody was eating out of a grapen, which is uh, the ter low German term for this huge um, bowl which was put over the fire. And before that, all of uh, the nuns had eaten separately in their cells. They had their maidservant who would cook for them. And uh, the community aspect became really important in the reform and led to this renewed uh, manuscript production and the kind of outreach drive in also uh, making sure that the lay sisters could participate in uh, the learning of the nuns. Um, and uh, part of that is then the production of model manuscripts. And um, this is uh, one of the Psalters now in the Dombibliothek, so the same place where the St. Alban Psalter uh, now is, uh, written um, by a sister, Elisabeth von Winsen, and um, she wrote um, a poem in hexameters, Leoni Leoninic hexameters, so rhyming hexameters, in which she describes um, how she produced the manuscript and why. Well, that's a uh, rare insight into um, what motivated the nuns to, to write. So um, she first says, um, script uh, explicit, explicit, que cordis intima promunt. So now here ends what was produced from the intima cordis, from the innermost part of my heart. Scriptando manu, while scribing with a hand, scribing with a hand, to talk the corporis uso, but under uh, using all of the body. That's a kind of topos of medieval scribes. Um, it's uh, wrong to think it's only the fingers who produce uh, the manuscript. You have to uh, use your whole body and mind and soul to, to produce this manuscript. Ut clare patibit oculo quos cuncta rimabit, so that would be clearer opened up what is hidden to the eye. Scripta cum floribus, so it's written uh, with flourishes, uh, the manuscript illumination. And all this was done, and then comes the first red bit in meeting. Um, claustro Lüneborg propositato, so this. Um, Convent of Meding, close to Lüneburg, uh, Ordinis ut fatio cisterciensis et utor, so uh, by somebody adhering to the Cistercian order. Then the next red bit uh, is De Vinsen, so her family name, also the place of origin. Vinsen is a little town near Lüneburg, from where the, uh, one of the patrician families in Lüneburg originally came but they had been resident in Lüneburg for centuries before that. Elisabeth, um, then her first name. And uh, then she gives a very learned riddle uh, where you have to calculate the exact date of the manuscript production by a complex Latin formula. You have to double certain numbers and add them to uh, so many other um, um, numbers, so showing her learning in, in the way in which she gives the date. And then she says it was done on behalf of uh, the provost, and that's the next red bit, Thielemann von Bavenstedt. He's the one who saw, whom you saw 
in the previous panel with a five liturgical manuscript in honor of his aunt Elisabeth de Bavenstedt. And um, so this is the, um, she wrote the Psalter and her sister Wienheit von Winsen wrote a model prayer book, which then uh, could be copied by the other nuns. And um, you can see it's a manuscript crammed full with meaning and layers of illustration. You see uh, the same type of celebrating uh, nuns and lay sisters, which we had seen on the title image from the Oxford Prayer Book, um, which is later actually than the uh, Hildesheim Prayer Book. So they learned it from this model um, manuscript of how to um, show the celebration. And you see what you couldn't see really on my title slide, that the nuns and um, the lay people aren't on their own, but that they are joined on the right hand side and on the top by the angels who are also singing along from the same hymn sheet. And on the left hand side, you see with a triple uh, crown, um, one of the popes, Pope Gregory, who is also um, confirming that it's uh, the right thing that they are doing in singing together in praise of the Easter sun, which is just rising above uh, the nuns. You see the smiley face here and above it is a quotation from the Easter se sequence that the nuns would sing. He looks at this, quam fecit dominus, mortem devas dans, et victor suis apparens. So that's from the sequence Laudes Salvatori, and you see the little red dots above there, um, which indicate uh, the music notation. Um, it's not enough uh, without the lines that you could learn the uh, sequence from there, but it's just as an indication similar to the goal that it's uh, everybody should break out into song out of joy for for um, Easter. Um, and they see it as their epitalamium, so their wedding song, actually, this uh, the day has lit up eluxedies, which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in there. And um, this, uh, the first stage of manuscript production in meeting um, was only one step on the way because the nuns kept constantly revising and updating their manuscripts. And that's something that you can also see in the St. Alban Psalter, which, where the Psalter images were juggled round. So the image of David that originally probably, um, or, uh, uh, and St. Alban that opened the prayer, uh, the Psalter then wandering to the end and a uh, new opening being added. So here you see that the nuns constantly expanded um, their singing. Uh, you have this extra half page being sewn into uh, and glued into uh, the uh, volume. You see um, things are rubbed out and written over. So it's not a, a static um, a book. It's a living document that uh, can be overwritten like a word file that you would update for every new uh, uh, occurrence. This is um, actually the handbook for the meeting provost, which allowed him to then conduct the liturgy. So he had to be um, on the newest information. And it also ended up in, in Oxford. So um, we have now from the conventual reform in 1479, more or less up to uh, the period of the Lutheran Reformation, 
uh, scriptorium that would, would continue to um, copy, expand, uh, and uh, play around with the text. So just to show you how this variation, it's like a variation over a, a theme worked. Um, on the left hand side, you have a manuscript which is now in uh, Harvard in the Horton Library, which has um, the same uh, text that you see on the right hand side in the Hildesheim manuscript, but arranged in a different way. You have the sun reduced to a kind of a uh, yellow curtain in the initial E uh, above uh, the figure, but the figure is holding uh, the same text that the lay people are holding in the Hildesheim manuscripts. Uh, they are holding Also Heilig ist Dese Dach, which was a vernacular song of praise, and that is also in the left hand side on the Horton Library uh, manuscript. And um, a particular feature is that each of the nuns would personalize their prayer books. So um, one major um, occurrence for them to write for were the high feasts, but the other major um, opportunity for them to write their own prayer books were actually the apostle feasts because each of the nuns would have their personal uh, patron apostle. So they would do, uh, draw lots for uh, which apostle was their personal apostle, and they would write for that their own prayer book. And here you see uh, the nun Barbara Fischkuhle, who had as patron saint St. Bartholomew, uh, who was flayed alive as uh, his martyrdom, and she has uh, copied a woodcut, colored it, colored it in, and sewn it into the manuscript in a way that um, if you turn over the page, which had a flaw, namely a ho hole in the parchment, you could use this as a peephole to look um, at uh, the uh, saint's face which also, of course, is a, a way of playing with the materiality of parchment. So um, you look through the torn skin of the animal uh, at uh, the apostle who is um, skinned uh, alive, uh, which shows how uh, careful the nuns picked each of these elements of their uh, production to match to the content, the materiality to the uh, content. And on the right hand side, you see um, a colorful caption, um, De vivo excoriato apostolo. So this is a prayer about the skinned alive apostle. And then you see him on the left hand side looking through the parchment hole. Um, and you can imagine that with this kind of personal relationship to the prayer books, which were more than just reference works, they were um, a direct link to uh, God and uh, the saints, uh, the nuns wouldn't be parted from their prayer books in the Reformation, but had to agree to a certain form of updating of uh, the prayer books uh, to allow for um, Lutheran uh, doctrine. And uh, the main point for um, the Protestant Duke was that uh, no more invocation of saints should take place. So on the left hand side, you have crossed out a prayer addressed to John the Evangelist. And on the right hand side, you have a new prayer inserted uh, in Low German addressed to Christ as the mediator, the only mediator, as uh, the Lutheran um, uh, doctrine uh, wanted it. But you see also that on the right hand side, the initial is actually glued in. 
And this is recycled from the cutout pages that originally were addressed to John the Evangelist. So the nun takes over into her new Protestant identity as much of uh, the previous content as possible. And also, if you look at how she crossed out uh, the prayer, it's uh, very similar to the highlighting that she had used in beforehand to underline Johannes in the first line. Um, and you can still read the full text despite the crossing out. So you see um, the live character of these manuscripts that would adjust to the changing uh, theological situation of the period. And um, I've just as a parallel, uh, you see here in the St. Albans Psalter in the lowest line, Ordinatio Sancti Gregorii, and then you just have a smudge, uh, and there would have stood Pape, so Pope Gregory uh, the Great, the same authority that we've just seen sitting at the bottom of uh, the meeting prayer book page here, uh, left in the calendar, and just uh, the offensive attribute of Pope being taken out. But uh, not to lose uh, his intercession. Um, flexible adoption. And now we come actually where the manuscript movements um, uh, merge from England uh, to Hildesheim and from Meeding uh, to Hildesheim. Um, so in the Reformation period, Germany uh, which consisted of these many small principalities, um, adopted the principle that every prince could uh, determine, uh, or princes, uh, which denomination their territory should follow. So um, you could have within a radius of 30 kilometers, you could have three different denominations in, in Germany. and. Um, so Meding is in this green, uh, a dark green territory of the uh, Duchy of Brunswick-Lüneburg, but uh, it's not far to the light green territory, which is the Bishop of Hildesheim, who was a prince bishop, a bit like Durham, a powerful secular prince as well as spiritual ruler. So uh, he kept his territory Catholic. So the abbess of Meding took her most precious manuscripts and brought them to Hildesheim. Then uh, she was assured by the Duke that she could safely return and that they could uh, continue living as Protestant community, but she left some of the manuscripts behind in Hildesheim. And um, there, um, in the early 17th century, arrived the English Benedictines, also appealing to the Bishop of Hildesheim as Catholic prince to uh, give them shelter. So he gave them the convent of Lamspringe, which had changed uh, Protestant Catholic territories several times. So. Um, it had become in between Protestant and uh, the nuns had left, and then it had become Catholic again, but there weren't any longer nuns around in Lamspringe. So the English Benedictines could take it over, but he gave them not only the convent, but also parts of the uh, library that he had been given by other um, communities for safekeeping. So uh, they were kitted out uh, with uh, prayer books, Latin prayer books, written by the nuns in Meding. And uh, you see here one of the Meding prayer books, which is now in the Stadtarchiv Hildesheim. And you see on the right hand side, a fairly scribbled uh, entry, Liber Monasterii Lamspring Congregationis Anglicane. So, Kong 
angle um, here written at the right hand side. Um, so the uh, English Benedictines um, and got the shelf mark S, uh, which would have been the bookcase and the fourth manuscript in the in the, that particular bookcase. And if you now look at um, the St. Albans Psalter, you'll see the same uh, rather flourish tent uh, writing on the top um, Liber Monasterie Lampspring OB, um, uh, the Benedictine order, Conk Angel, again of the, of the Anglican congregation. And then you have S again for the book uh, case and one. Uh, so there would have been two manuscripts between the St. Albans Psalter and uh, the meeting manuscript on the, uh, in the book case in uh, Lamspringe. And um, I've uh, put here on the right hand side just one of the folios because um, if you look more closely, you'll see here also signs of a cut and paste approach to manuscript. So the initial was produced separately and then glued in in the same way in which we have seen uh, the initial in the uh, meeting Psalter being glued into uh, the later prayer. And um, you see a, a similar scene in a way to the one we've seen with the nuns and the lay people. So it's also a combination of um, a leading woman praying to Christ and a, a congregation in that case of probably monks of St. Alban um, following her interceding for them to Christ. And I, I thought I would use this for uh, just some side by side. It's definitely not that one copied from the others. Uh, they were produced in different centuries in different congregations, but just to, uh, to show how uh, the um, European models of how to depict elements of the Psalter um, and of other theological concepts were shared. Uh, so the left one is uh, the Psalter where we had seen the uh, poem at the end by Elisabeth von Winsen and uh, she imagines David as a quite smashing young man um, playing uh, the harp and uh, sitting inside uh, the initial for the first psalm, Beatus Will. Um, happy is the, blessed is the man who does not walk in the uh, ways of the impious, but rather walks in the ways of the Lord. And um, you have the same image of David, even though slightly older, um, uh, well, he's uh, three centuries older than uh, the David on the left hand side. So no wonder that um, he has a beard. But um, with a, a harp and uh, also sitting in the B of the Beatus will. He has the advantage over the younger one that he is uh, being inspired directly by uh, a bird um, of the Holy Ghost, or something like that. Uh, and the St. Alban Psalter has a second image uh, of uh, David as musician, which I've um, juxtaposed with another young David from another meeting uh, Psalter, but uh, similarly placed in a whole um, decorative framework. Um, there are other uh, concepts that were as important for the St. Alban community as they were for the meeting uh, community, and that's particularly the apparitions of Christ after Easter, which seem to have been a, a central model, especially for female uh, piety. 
Um, and on the left hand side, you see actually Christ breaking the bread and two nuns sitting at on either end of the table, becoming part of the Emmaus scene. And um, you see it staged as in a like in a religious play. So the um, disciples saying above, uh, Lord, stay with us because uh, the evening is coming and then actually plucking his uh, coat to keep him from uh, going off. And you have the same uh, grammatic staging in the St. Albans um, Psalter. And um, another favorite image which occurs in the St. Albans Psalter and in the meeting uh, books is uh, the resurrection of the souls from limbo and um, the distinguishing feature is the that the meeting hell mouth has more teeth and um, you can always uh, distinguish a northern german hell mouth which has a, a quite impressive row of teeth while this hell mouth has just two uh, kind of no three front teeth uh, so this was just a kind of illustrated interlude. Um, then uh, the meeting manuscripts uh, kept uh, spreading across uh, first Germany and then further afield because in the 18th century the abbess of meeting decided that she wouldn't keep the rest of the manuscripts that originally had been uh, kept behind in the convent. And um, she uh, sold and gave away uh, superfluous precious objects, as uh, she said. And uh, they uh, were met by the first wave of antiquarian interest so you see here a donation remark in a Gutting uh, manuscript. Yeah, so uh, this was the um, Abbess Katharina von Stöterogen who sold um, most of the manuscripts because her predecessor in the 16th century had only taken the most precious manuscripts, but not the uh, bulk of those manuscripts which were still in use in the convent. Um, and uh, the sale of the manuscript actually financed um, a new built uh, a convent which um, was built under the protection of King George II. Um, since meeting was part of the kingdom of Hanover. Uh, the nuns were um, actually um, also responsible to uh, the, the king of Hanover. And at the same time, the antiquarian interest in all of the antiquities from the convent grew. Um, and once the sale had started to antiquarian collectors, uh, this spread out across uh, Europe and uh, the um, English uh, book collectors were actually particularly eager to buy up um, these small but quite precious looking uh, manuscripts. So um, you have lots of uh, sales and they um, appreciated the manuscripts not just for their content, but also for their materiality. So a number um, of manuscripts ended up in the Victoria and Albert Museum, not in the library, but in the leather department, because uh, they were bought to inspire um, artisans in 19th century England to um, learn medieval production techniques. So uh, they were bought for their fine tooling rather than for their devotional uh, uh, content. Um, yeah, and this is um, the um, this prayer book 
we have been looking at uh, the one with the skinning of Bartholomew, which was bought because of its fine leather um, binding. Also, the 19th century saw a new interest in the vernacular content of the manuscript. And that's also something linking it to the St. Albans Psalter, which has uh, been of particular interest um, from the 19th century onward for its um, Anglo-Norman uh, texts, the Alexius um, a song and other um, texts in medieval uh, French. So Heinrich Hoffmann von Faller's Leben, who uh, wrote, among others, uh, the German national anthem, um, was very interested in these Altertümer, the antiquities, uh, which he could extract from the manuscripts. Um, and uh, in a way, the academic study of German as language started with these um, poems and texts from uh, low German prayer books. Um, the English antiquarians uh, were interested in a kind of Gothic revival. So uh, on the, this is the Meeting Provost Handbook, the one we had seen with an additional half page. And what looks most medieval um, about it, namely the golden plaque on the front, is actually the book plate of the 19th century Yorkshire collector Edward Hailstone, who imitated the leather tooling and uh, made it uh, his own. So you can see it's much more regular uh, than the tooling of uh, the 15th century, but inspired by it also the, the kind of Gothic lettering, which could be taken directly from the ABC here in, in meeting. So he, he learned uh, how to be medieval by uh, copying the meeting prayer books. Um, another interesting case is um, the Psalter where uh, we saw the crossed out prayer to John the Evangelist because in the 19th century an antiquarian bookseller tried to make it more medieval by gluing in a little pluck from um, a reliquary and uh, then uh, having a flower frame um, glued round it to make it look uh, proper Gothic um, and not so scruffy. Um, and this had a kind of a comic postlude because um, the 21st century seller of it, Les Enlumineurs, ripped this plug out because they believed it to be ivory and they wanted to sell the manuscript in the States where you aren't allowed to import um, endangered species and ivory is endangered species. Um, the Bodleian uh, managed to buy back both the manuscript and the plug and when the conservator and the Bodleian looked at the plug, he found out that it's not ivory, it's cow horn. Um, so not really an endangered species, but uh, this is a late medieval also reimagining of earlier medieval ivory uh, work. Um, and then in the 20th century, you see um, a renewed interest in the text, not just as linguistic text, but also as a devo devotional resource. So uh, in a way, uh, re-engaging with the content of the manuscripts. And I found particularly fascinating how uh, this prayer book had been bought by um, the abbot of Gethsemane um, Abbey in, in the States 
who wanted um, to build up a manuscript library in the American um, Cistercian convent that could um, pick up the European tradition of manuscript collection. Um, and from there, uh, the meeting manuscripts have been in a way at the forefront of digitization since uh, they were always so attractive with their uh, um, illumination and, and gold. So some of the earliest um, digitized medieval manuscripts have been these prayer books. And uh, you can now study a whole history of um, digitization by looking at the different uh, websites um, and that uh, the digitization project brings me now to an end of my former presentation um, where I want just to conclude by uh, saying how important it is to look at the materiality of these uh, manuscripts and how they have been refashioned for every century um, to uh, address the audience of their time and to bring across the, the content as well as the form of uh, devotion. And um, this is a, in a way a challenge for us or a, a task for us to continue uh, keeping the manuscripts relevant by updating it and writing about it. And I can really recommend uh, looking at the website uh, that was built up by the Bodleian Library together with the um, HRB, the Herzog August Bibliothek in Wolfenbüttel, to share um, not just the digital manuscripts, but also uh, blog posts trying to open up their significance for um, a contemporary audience. Many thanks. Uh, I was just, sorry, I'm Henry, I'm just going to spotlight myself. Um, one moment, I can find it. This is where we realize that despite a year and a half on Zoom, I'm no more proficient than I was at the beginning. Um, I would just like to say a massive thank you to Henrika for such a fascinating presentation. Um, I'm sure for many of us it was amazing to see the mating manuscripts and also how varied their lives are and that they have lives in the same way, you know, they have object lives in the same way that we do from, you know, their creation, how much they changed and adapted over time. Um, and they're also just absolutely stunning to look at. So thank you so much for sharing that with us this evening. Um, and I would just like to invite everyone to uh, take ourselves off mute um, with a round of applause to show our appreciation. Thank you so much.